I'm Silvia Peregrino. I'm an associate professor of government here at EPCC. And today we're having a special show of Entre Nosotras Latina Voices. And today we're focusing inward. Uh, we have members of the EPCC Safe Reopening Task Force with us. And uh, I thought that maybe as students, faculty and staff, we would wanna hear a little bit about the work that they've been doing for the past few months. Uh, to keep us all safe as we transition back into campus uh, next year. Uh, and so I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Maria Alvarez, uh, Officer Hector Padilla, and Mr. Ivan Flores. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Thank and, you. And so uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, your background? and what position or departments do you represent? And uh, we'll start with ladies first. Uh, so we'll start with Dr. Alvarez. Yes, uh, thank you for inviting me to join this uh, program. Uh, my name is Maria Alvarez. I'm a professor of biology uh, here at El Paso Community College, Trans Mountain Campus. I'm the coordinator of biology and, and chemistry at my campus and the uh, director of the Rise to the Challenge Bridge Program. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Mr. Flores. Uh, hi, I'm Ivan Flores and I am the safety specialist for the college and I am work, I work with under the uh, Office of Risk Management and Safety and that's kind of an umbrella for or underneath uh, human resources. Thank you. Uh, Officer Padilla. Yes, my name is Hector Padilla. Um, I'm the emergency manager for the college and I work under uh, Chief Ramirez with the campus, campus Police Department. Okay, so so thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how the SAFE uh, Reopening Task Force started? Uh, sure, so when the college um, decided to go online back in March or after spring break, uh, it was sometime in April, uh, I was approached, uh, uh, myself and Ivan, by Dr. Benya, and he had uh, stated that they, there was an idea to start a safe campus uh, task force, and he asked if uh, myself and Mr. Flores would, would head that up and, uh, you know, begin building a team um, uh, so that we could be, begin making preparations for reopening campus, uh, specifically to help uh, have the students that were uh, needing to finish the spring semester for their hands-on portions, uh, classes like uh, automotive and the nursing programs, health programs, welding, uh, those types, uh, so that they could come back onto campus in a safe manner uh, so that they could finish out their spring semester. Okay, and what, um, what lessons have you learned? Uh, what do you wish, uh, what do you know now that you wish you knew in March? Um, I, I wish I knew uh, how um, um, how difficult it was going to be to to be able to track cases, and that's some of the biggest thing. And I know we'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, the hardest part has been tracking cases of, of COVID that that uh, we get reported that get reported to the college. Uh, so contact tracing, uh, my experience in contact tracing was almost non-existent prior to this. Uh, so with the experience and, and, and you know, some of the uh, events that we've had to deal with in the college, that has helped me, but um, I wish I was better trained in contact tracing back in March. Okay. Um, and what, uh, as members of the task force, what are you most proud of? Well, I, I think I was uh, very impressed when I, I didn't join from the very beginning. But um, I, I was very impressed with, um, you know, the, the dedication that um, the members uh, have to this. You know, they, we all see the importance uh, of this um, safety task force primarily. And, um, you know, we meet um, almost every day. You know, we've reduced it to four, four meetings per week. Um, but initially we were meeting pretty much every day and, uh, you know, trying to trying to keep uh, our student faculty staff, you know, safe. Uh, that's the main goal. And I think we're all very, very committed to that goal. 
and uh, very you know the, the way all the contact tracing has been done you know how dedicated all the staff is as far as you know making sure that um, everything is processed even if they have to work after hours or over the weekend you know all of this is, is a lot of hard work and, and it just shows the dedication of uh, you know all of us in, in, in this group yeah and if i could add something to that you know i'm sorry ivan uh but uh you know the task force is a large it's a large group and so you have a lot of uh ex different experiences and and areas of expertise in the and the way that we've been able to come together and work together effectively uh to help address you know these issues of safety and and making a safer learning environment for our students and a safer working environment for our employees uh i think that's that's something that i'm proud of uh it's not always easy uh sometimes there's a lot of differing opinions on how we should approach things and how should we get things done uh but at the end of the day you know i'm, I'm really impressed by uh how everyone involved really cares about the college uh cares about its students uh cares about its faculty and its staff uh and 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 that everybody just wants to do a good job and and and, and just parade or provide a safer environment and and so since uh, since you guys brought up the the contact tracing, uh, could you talk a little bit about you know how how that works uh, for the people that are coming into campus? So we ask that um, students and, and or faculty and staff if they've been either exposed to a positive case of COVID or they themselves have tested positive, uh, that they notify their supervisor, their instructor. Uh, and with that notification, we gather information, uh, for example, you know, when did the exposure occur or when did you receive a positive uh, notification? Um, you know, are you, are you exhibiting signs and symptoms? Uh, and we gather all this information together and, and myself and Ivan and, and employee relations with uh, Malena Field, we, we kind of figure out <clears throat> if there are any other exposures within the college. Uh, we're talking other students, uh, other faculty or staff, uh, employees. And if there are, then we issue notices of exposure to those individuals saying, you know, you may have potentially been exposed to COVID. These are the steps that you need to take uh, in, in order to ensure your own safety for one, but also uh, so that we can have you back onto campus. Okay, okay. So that's uh, that would be the, the process if if somebody's back on on campus and uh dr alvarez i understand that some of your students are actually um on campus because of of science labs that they need to do could you talk a little bit about what changes have been made in the trans mountain campus to to safely bring the students back on campus uh yes um we we have this program uh, it's called rise to the challenge bridge program and it is uh, funded through a grant from the National Institutes of Health. And uh, the, the idea is to provide the students with all the tools to be successful in their you know, math and science courses and um, you know, promote their transfer to both UTEP and NMSU. So UTEP and NMSU are partners on, on this effort. And some of the activities, uh, well, we have paid uh, research internships. The, the students get paid to work uh, in a lab. Um, you know, 19 hours a week, um, and they uh, conduct a scientific research project. They do this under the mentorship of EPCC faculty and in collaboration with UTEP and NMSU faculty. So they are employees of the college and they, they need to, you know, fulfill their objectives. For example, uh, one of the main goals is that they get to present their, their results of their scientific project at a national conference. And there is this uh, conference called the Annual Biomedical Research Conference for Minority Students, uh, ABRCMS. We just, for short, this ABRCMS. And, you know, this has been going on for the last 20 years or so, where students from all over the U.S. present the results of their work. So they are under the, you know, the, the, the pressure and, and, and the deadline, you know, that they need to complete the project and present it as one of the objectives of the grant. And, and so, you know, the students needed to work on their projects so that they would be able to submit uh, a summary uh, for consideration for presentation uh, uh, in early September. And actually, the meeting is, is going to start um, next week. So um, 
when the uh, the college was uh, you know shut down um, back in in March, you know we had to stop uh, the students from from doing the work, and they were not able to re return until July in the summer. And we had to develop a protocol, you know, that will ensure that the students, uh, you know, would be safe, and everybody else would be safe as as they work on their research project. And they had to do it expeditiously because, you know, they they lost, uh, you know, a few months already. So they will have enough to present. And, you know, we're very proud that the students were able to do the work and uh, submit five abstracts for presentation and they were accepted for presentation. Uh, this meeting is uh, now virtual, like most conferences are these days. Um, but, it, you know, it used to take place in various, uh, you know, big cities of, of the United States. So um, we got, you know, five of the students were able to complete the project and submit it, and it was accepted for presentation. So, you know, that that, that was the, the driving force for that group of, of students that are working and getting paid to do this. Uh, but also we have another component of the grant, which expands the benefits of doing scientific research to all the students enrolled in a class, either a biology class or a chemistry class. Uh, they don't get paid to do it, but they get the exposure. And, you know, doing scientific research is really the, the ideal way to get students exposed to the real nature of science, you know, the investigative nature of science. So getting them into a, a hands-on project is essential in their, you know, scientific training. So we've been implementing these projects that are called course-based undergraduate research experiences, and it's short for CURES, you know. C-U-R-E-S, course-based undergraduate research experiences. So we have these implemented in uh, introductory biology, uh, microbiology, and organic chemistry courses. And um, again, the students in March, I mean, in, in the spring, they they had started, you know, their 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 project, but they had to to stop. You know, some of them you know, were they were at different stages, so so they they had to stop. So we had to develop a, a way to, in the fall, you know, be able to offer these cures to, you know, a certain number of sections, so we can fulfill the objectives of the grant, and and having the students participate in a project while you know staying safe, right? So that was the the main priority. So again, we had to develop a protocol, a safety protocol for the students that are going to be, uh, the that actually you know, are coming onto our campus during the fall, during the semester. And it was uh, a lot of work, you know, we got a lot of help from uh, Mr. Padilla and Mr. Flores, and uh, we developed a, a protocol where you identify, you know, all the entrances and the exits so that students don't, don't crowd around each other. Uh, you know, it is, it is essential that we keep the numbers uh, small. So for the, the cures that were implemented in, in, in courses, we uh, had to divide the class into two groups, basically, and, and that would be less than 10, uh, you know, present in, in a particular lab, you know, at any particular time. We wouldn't have more than 10 people. So for the social distancing aspect of it. So we had to reduce the number of uh, students that could enroll in a class. So, you know, it, it was a lot of work and, and this basically uh, had to be implemented uh, at our campus. It was not implemented district-wide because, you know, the logistics of it is, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's difficult. But we were able to do it for our campus and for select classes in introductory biology, microbiology, and organic chemistry. So these are hybrid courses that we're conducting um, uh, on campus, at Trans Mountain Campus, this semester. And then we have the same thing planned for the spring semester. And um, I, I, you know, the, the students have been doing projects um, that are, you know, um, you know, very relevant to our uh, El Paso international community, but and also uh, some of them related to to COVID-19, to epidemiology. Um, so they, um, you know, they were able to collect uh, samples from the Rio Grande River, and they were isolating back. They have been isolating bacteria and characterizing them. Uh, as far as identifying them and also determining the antibiotic resistance patterns um, that which you know multiple drug resistance is one of the probably right now is the second major public health uh, issue you know besides COVID-19 and um, they uh, you know they were able to study a problem that is relevant to our community.
Uh, we also developed, um, you know, some uh, projects. Uh, they're in the process of being developed this semester. Uh, that would be online, you know, on, online research projects or online cures. And those are the ones where the students don't come to the lab. Um, they're analyzing like epidemiological data uh, on number of cases of COVID-19, you know, looking at trying to uh, find, you know, the distribution patterns of the disease in, in different places of the world. So it's, it's a research project, but it's not hands-on. For, for the hands-on, you know, we we are convinced that um, the way we're implementing the classes in, uh, and so that the, the students can come to campus, we're convinced that we're keeping them safe. And, and uh, you know, I, I wanted to show, if I can show that uh, first uh, slide, uh, where you can see that it is possible to do this. It is possible to keep the students safe in, in the classroom by implementing uh, simple things. You know, I, I don't know if you can uh, see um, the, the slide, but uh, you basically uh, reduce the, you know, the risk by putting barriers in between, uh, you know, a person and uh, someone else that uh, may be around. So on this, uh, on this slide, you know, you can see that the person on the left at the top, you know, is uh, a person that is uh, potentially potentially infected with uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID-19 disease, and uh, if they're talking to each other, they're you know close together. You can see what the risk is: it's about 90 percent, right? Without any mask, without any barrier. If the person that is not infected on the right, on the second pair of uh, heads that you see there, uh, is wearing a mask, you reduce the risk to 30 percent. If the person that is infected on the left, you can see that on the on the third pair of people, uh, the one on the left is wearing a mask, right? Um, you reduce the risk to 5%. Now, if both of them are wearing a mask, you reduce the risk of transmission to 1.5%. And if on top of that, you know, they separate at least six feet apart, you, you reduce the risk to almost zero, right? So. The, the more barriers you put in, you know, the, the safer people are going to be. It is doable. You know, we, we, we have this fear against uh, this virus um, and, and, you know, rightly so, because it can cause very severe disease, but um, in, in, in a certain percentage of the population. But, but it is something that can be contained. Um, you know, I tell my students and I teach microbiology, you know, this what a time to be a microbiologist. And, and uh, my, my training was in environmental virology. Actually, for my doctoral work, I studied the mechanisms of inactivation of viruses. So I was not using a respiratory virus. I was working with poliovirus, uh, but um, we were looking at how viruses get inactivated or killed. And, um, you know, they, they have this, you know, there, there's a way to control the disease. So in the lab, of course, you know, everybody wears a mask. But in addition to that, uh, our students are wearing face shields. So a second barrier, right? In addition to that, of course, you know, they, you know, wash their hands, disinfect their hands, but they're wearing gloves when, when they're uh, working. That's the standard practice. You know, they always wear gloves and they wear a, a disposable lab coat. So all of these barriers, right? Did you have a question? I, I had a question. Uh, so right now with the reduced number of students, are the labs, um, are they like six feet apart from each other? on their workstations? Yes, yes, they are and six feet apart. They're six, and we are, we we being the college, we're providing the masks and the face shields for them as they're coming they, on campus? They, they, they bring their own masks, but we do have disposable masks in case, you know, they drop one or, you know, something happens. They know we have extras, you know, disposable masks. Do we provide the face shields for the students? And, and that is being covered by the grant because, you know, all of these projects are funded by a grant. So we provide the, the face shields and the, and the gloves and, and the disposable lab coats for them. And, and like I said, we, we had to find um, two rooms that were continue, you know, two labs that were side by side or pretty close so that we can split the class into two groups. Right. And, uh, and half of the class meets in, in one room and then the other half in the other room. And the instructor kind of goes back and forth. And we also, paid by the grant, we have 
uh, a supplemental instructor uh, facilitators that uh, assist uh, the students. So, you know, we're, we've been able to, to implement this. And then, you know, I, I just wanted to show the next slide and, and um, because, you know, there's, and, and I, I don't know if you can, if you can read the print, um, can you make it a little bigger maybe? But um, th this is um, from the Texas Medical Association. And, you know, as, as we plan to, uh, you know, as we go through our plans to reopen the campuses more, you know, right now we have very few people on, on campus. And, um, and but as, as we plan, you know, we, we need to, I think, ma make our community aware again that it is a dangerous virus, but it can be contained. And uh, like I said, you know, the face mask, the face shield, you know, putting all of those barriers. But also the, the crowding factor is an important one. And, um, you know, you can see on this um, on this chart, you know, they go from at the top, you know, the activities that have the lowest risk of, of transmission uh, of COVID. And then at the bottom is those activities that have the, the highest risk. I think these two slides that I'm showing are, are very, very revealing as, as far as, you know, really telling people what's important to pay attention to. Uh, as, as we reopen businesses, as we reopen schools and, and things like this. Um, you know, we've been talking about eating at a restaurant, for example. You know, if, if you see there, uh, eating at a restaurant uh, outside, it's at the mo moderate to low risk. Eating at a restaurant inside is at a mo moderate to high risk, right? Uh, again, many other factors, uh, how crowded that place is. You know, as, as you eat, you take off the mask. Uh, if you start shouting and laughing, you know, uh, the more force you use in exhaling, the farther you're going to spread the viruses to other people. If the place is very crowded, you know, and is not well ventilated, all of these things have to be taken into account. Um, you know, they talk about HEPA filters on HVAC systems and um, this virus is is a lot smaller. You know, viruses are a lot smaller than bacteria. Uh, you know, bacteria are micrometer size. Viruses are nanometer size. Um, you know, this uh, SARS-CoV-2 is about 160. So uh, a lot of the regular HEPA filters are not going to filter out the virus. So you need to find other you know ways of treating you know installing the HVAC systems if you want to add yet another layer of protection. Right, uh, which is you know not filtering but treating the air that circulates, uh, putting bringing in more air from the outside into the inside of the building. You know all of those measures have to be taken into account, and there are several uh, you know techniques that can be used like ultraviolet light, uh, something that is called needlepoint bipolar ionization, which kills viruses as the air passes through the HVAC system. You know all of these things add yet another. You know, they're expensive, but they add another layer of protection and, and prevention. So I, I think at, at my campus, I'm, I'm, I'm very confident uh, that we're doing everything to reduce the risk to almost nothing, to really zero, just by putting the layers that, that we're talking about and, you know, keeping the numbers low, right? And there's also a lot of uh, air being circulated. It, the labs are very well ventilated. So um, I'm, I'm convinced that that we're doing an, an excellent job. And there are hybrid courses that we're offering also for the spring, like organic chemistry, like microbiology, and, and some introductory biology, um, 1306, 1106 courses. Um, I'm, I'm convinced that, you know, the students are, they're not gonna be transmitting the virus within our campus. I mean, they may catch it outside in the community, especially when the numbers are terribly high. But with the measures that we have implemented, they're not going to transmit it in, in the laboratory or in the classroom. And I, I think that's great that we're having uh, Trans Mountain be kind of like the test site for the college. And if we can uh, get the procedures down there, then we could expand to the other campuses. Um, and right now, as, as we're doing this interview early November, uh, El Paso is number three in the country in terms of for cities of its size in terms of COVID infections. Uh, and so the college did decide to keep some of the 
keep the majority of classes online for, for spring 2021, but with some classes uh, mentioned earlier by Mr. Padilla, some of the science classes mentioned by Dr. Alvarez, those are those are coming on campus. And so, uh, you know, I, I feel better just uh, hearing from you and uh, with you having the science background, uh, I feel better about, you know, uh, returning to, to campus uh, in the in the future and uh, hopefully also with with a vaccine or with the numbers uh, down. Exactly. And if I could add something to that, we actually have um, labs that are taking place at every other campus with the exception of Northwest. Uh, you know, so at Rio Grande, at Valle Verde, at Mission del Paso, uh, we have other labs that are meeting face-to-face uh, -face, uh, where the same precautions and uh, that Dr. Alvarez mentioned uh, they're in place there as well. Yeah, the, the, those are uh, for the CTE divisions, you know, the career and technical education uh, programs. Uh, but uh, uh, Trans Mountain is the only campus that, that offers the science, you know, the basic science, biology, and chemistry courses, right, as of right now, and then also for the spring. So, so we are, uh, we do have students at multiple campuses and we're using what we're learning to uh, right now, I guess it's a soft reopening and then hopefully sometime in, next summer uh, we'll go into a, a full uh, reopening for the campuses. Uh, and, and also we're making these decisions based on indicators. Uh, I, I have, could I, should I show that um, list of indicators or uh, Mr. Padilla, do you want to address that? Sure. So these indicators um, were, were pulled from the, uh, back in May, uh, President Trump had uh, developed a plan in, in, in coordination with uh, the CDC on reopening America. Uh, and in that plan, they listed these, these metrics uh, that we should be following in, 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 in making the determination on, on when to open. Uh, so as you see there, there there's five of them, 14-day uh, uh, decreasing cases, uh, the rolling or moving seven-day positivity rate, uh, the cumulative positivity rate, uh, the robust uh, testing program, and the infection rate. Um, currently, um, Dr. Serata and Dr. Peña, uh, they do a very good job of, of updating their records uh, on a daily basis updating uh, the actual numbers that are that are coming in and weekly um, there's a, a COVID planning team that that it's myself and Mr. Flores, uh, Malena Field, Dr. Peña and, and Dr. Serata that meet and we discuss these metrics uh, to see where we stand as a community uh, and I talk about El Paso, uh, the city of El Paso and the county. Uh, so when we started measuring these metrics uh, as a college, the plan was to figure out where we were so that we could eventually have employees return back to work. Uh, and then eventually, you know, hopefully opening the college on, on a larger scale to, you know, for face to face, uh, besides those that we've already discussed. Uh, so, you know, we started looking at the 14 days uh, of decreasing cases. Um, there was a period up to about maybe a month and a half ago where we were having that, but as you all know, with the recent increase in cases, uh, you know, we continue to exceed that lately every 14 day period. Um, and with that, in order to meet those metrics, we would have to have cases for that 14 day period be less than what the previous 14 day period was uh, consistently so that we would feel more comfortable about opening up. Uh, the rolling seven day positivity rate average, um, that's just an average of the previous seven, uh, seven days uh, re that, re that deals with the positive cases that are coming in. Um, and the reason why they do an average is to kind of a, uh, account for, you know, maybe lapses in testing um, where you may have a large spike of numbers due to backlog testing and things like that. Uh, so, for us as a college, you know, we would hope that that number uh, would be 5% or lower 
uh, to for us to be comfortable in reopening, uh, at least for the previous 14 days. And currently right now, I believe we're at like almost 24%. Uh, so we're not even really close to meeting that metric. Uh, the cumulative uh, positivity rate, you know, that's just the the ongoing uh, number of positive tests that are that are coming in um, for, uh, for the college, we would be happy if that number was at 10% or lower. Um, but we've been well over the 10% mark, uh, probably about close to 12% uh, for the last seven to 10 days. Uh, the robust testing program, that's where, you know, at least the very minimum to have 50% of, of people receiving their tests results within 72 hours. Uh, that would be the, the very minimum that I think we'd be comfortable with. Uh, but at this time, I believe it's only around 20% of people are receiving their test results uh, within 72 hours, which is a very low uh, number. And then the infection rate, uh, that's just the, the number of positive cases of COVID per 100,000 in population. Um, and we would be comfortable if that number was at about 25 per uh, 100,000 of population. And right now we're at about 197 uh, per 100,000. That's what our current rate here locally in El Paso is. So, you know, for the college to be comfortable and begin opening up, uh, we would want to be hitting all these benchmarks. Um, but as, as you can tell, we're not meeting any of them at this time. And uh, thank you for, for sharing that. And as all of us know, since we've been keeping up with the news, uh, El Paso's really overwhelmed in terms of, of the hospitals having to add ICU beds, having to bring in nurses from FEMA, having to, uh, UMC is having like outside portable units because they're they're that uh, backed up. Uh, so, so good to know where those numbers are coming from. And, and so, Who's actually like tracking this? Is would this be the task force or your office that's getting these numbers from uh, also vetting vetting them with the county, finding out from? I, I'm thinking that there's some collaboration across. Uh, well, I'm hoping that there's some collaboration across the county, right? So yeah, uh, we get the numbers from what's reported, uh, and then also on the EP Strong website. Uh, so that's where we're getting our numbers from. And then also we'll go with the uh, DSHS website as well. And so we get all the information together. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we'll, we'll discuss it uh, with Dr. Sadata. And, and again, the, Dr. Sadata and Dr. Pena do a really great job of, of tracking these numbers. Uh, and and they, they have like an Excel sheet where they, they input their numbers on a daily basis. And, and and based on those numbers is what we'll use, you know, to eventually determine what uh, when we will open back up as far as allowing more employees uh, to come back to work. And and I know some of the school districts are participating on some fast track testing. Has that been offered to the community college? Um, uh, or I don't know if that's just more K-12 uh, that I know the Socorro district and the El Paso district were getting more fast tests for COVID? Yes, I believe it was for the school districts. Uh, we were not approached, uh, the college was not approached as far as to participate in that program. Okay, okay. And um, let's see, what else did I wanna ask about metrics? Uh, when you're measuring, when the college is making the decision to reopen, are they gonna do that citywide or would it be based on zip codes? Uh, myself, I live on the east side, so the east side, the 79938, were always like the number one uh, infection area. So probably Mission Campus uh, being uh, close to that zip code uh, would not be open. But are they have have they discussed if they're going to do that at the zip code level or if they're going to do that just uh, college wide? You know, waiting it would, for it would be college wide, and I think part of that would be. Uh... You know, you may live in the 38 zip code, but maybe you have to attend class at Valle or, you know, maybe you live in the Northeast, but you have to attend law enforcement at Mission del Paso. Uh, so, you know, it, it would be difficult to kind of uh, track things at that level. Uh, so we're we're just uh, we're concerned with the levels as a as a as a as a community uh, as a whole. 
on, on, what, on when we decide to reopen. No, and, and, you know, and I think just having this conversation, uh, we get to see how overwhelming uh, making these decisions are. And, and I, I feel more comfortable knowing that, uh, that the task force is on top of it and that you're tracking those numbers uh, and that we're piloting things to, to make sure that we do, when we do come back, uh, that it's in a safe uh, process. Uh, let me see what, what other uh, questions I have. We haven't heard much from you, Mr. Flores, so I don't know if you want to add uh, what your office in particular has been doing or talk about like the PPE purchases uh, mm -hmm. that we've done. Okay. Uh, with my office, what I have been doing, and essentially it's just not me, just me, it's also uh, Ms. Laura Saldana from the workers' comp office, since essentially we're both under kind of, like I said, the same umbrella of uh, HR. Essentially, we uh, kind of handle the approvals for the PPE that is requested for offices for the staff and also faculty. And essentially with that, what we try to do is just... Um, we tried to see what is kind of reasonable for providing to the faculty staff because I know right now everyone's trying to be a little bit more um, careful and having a little bit extra in hand. But the thing is, like I said, we try to be a little bit more reasonable and trying to give uh, certain supplies like the uh, disinfectant wipes, the disinfectant sprays, uh, a couple of the uh, disposable masks, and also the gloves as well. But just like I said, just so that way we can make sure that they have at least something to kind of take care of themselves. And, and you've been able, and you know, this is just me, you know, I haven't been able to find Clorox wipes in like forever or Lysol. Uh, the college has some secret providers that we have access to that equipment or, or, with that, or we're I, using alcohol. With that, I don't really want to say it just because I don't want to uh, give our sources away, but. Um, no, no, that's, just no yes. I'm, I'm just happy that you, <laughs> I, because I, I think that maybe they are holding those supplies for for hospitals, for nursing homes, and maybe for institutions of higher ed. So I, I'm just happy to hear that we that we have those. I, I'm kind of a planner, so I I knew about this, uh, you know, when I was uh, teaching government classes. So I have my I still have my little stockpile of Clorox wipes uh, that that I have, uh, but. You know, but good to know that the college is getting them for the for the workers that are that are staff members that are coming on campus, and and I know when I've been uh, wanting to go to my office, I have to check in 24 hours ahead uh, to make sure, and then I fill out a little questionnaire if if I had symptoms or not uh, before I'm I'm allowed back to to my office. I've only gone once uh, because I needed to get a textbook for a part time instructor that's new, uh, but you know, good good to know that those protocols and and procedures are are there. So uh, so the employees wouldn't. I I myself I'm kind of a planner, right? So I've been like buying all my masks at Costco and you know antibacterial stuff. Uh, so I would I would get something if if maybe the person is not as uh, paranoid as I am, uh, they would get something uh, coming back to the office anyway. Is there like a little kit? Uh, it's not really a kit, but the thing is there's a request form and what we do try to ask is the department fills it out because like I said, essentially sometimes the employees can be a little bit more um Hoarders. I putting it nicely, I guess that's the best term, but though. the thing is, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh essentially we just try to like I said, make sure that we do have the disinfectant supplies. So in case uh the person does need them, then of course they could use them. And essentially, like I said, uh, like I should have said before, it's not just limited to those items. We also have um, uh, items like uh, hand sanitizers as well and the face shields. Okay, okay. So, so we would be, uh, let's say, you know, if I uh, if I decide to, or if they ask me to teach uh, in person on in the summer, I, you know, I could bring my mask from home. Uh, but then ask for a face shield uh, that that are usually reusable, right? If we if we clean them off with Clorox and everything. Yes. Yes. And then with that, uh, one of the reasons why we went the way of uh, face shields is just because of the fact that with the plexiglass, it was going to be really difficult because like some of those pieces are very expensive, especially right now with everything going on. That's why we thought the face shields would be a better option as opposed to uh, trying to put plexiglass all over. 
Okay, so so we're not doing plexiglass uh, behind the computer desk where the people lecture. We're we're going more the face shield route. Yes, and it's just mostly that the uh, areas where people would be consistently in front of students, like say uh, financial aid or even the uh, cashier offices. That's where we're trying to at least uh, get the plexiglass. Okay, okay, so kind of like in the stores that they've put plexiglass and ask people to stand a couple of feet between them and the cashier. Yes. So we're, we're doing that as well. What what else have we have we done that maybe we haven't touched upon? You know, what what other um, I know that some of our staff members are, are going into the ASC and they talked about uh, some of the signs um, that that have been put. What other what other things are you doing to try to remind people to keep their their social distance? Uh, well, I don't really want to take credit for that from the safe uh, campus task force just because of the fact that it's actually a physical plant that has been actually getting us those uh, stickers and things like that. So essentially for uh, certain areas where you're going to have to wait in line, what they try to do is at least put the uh, little markings there, yellow and black uh, stripes of tape that they put on the floor so that way people know where the six foot mark would be. And also they were post, uh, what's called posting. Uh, different types of um, posters, just the way the people can remember about their face masks, uh, wearing their face masks on campus, uh, that we are a business that requires a face mask, and also um, making sure that they do, or people who do walk into our facility, maintain that six foot distance. And like uh, Dr. Alvarez was mentioning about the classrooms, was that we are trying to at least make sure that there's certain areas that are considered entrances and exits, just mm -hmm. so a way we could sort of uh, make sure that our janitorial staff does take care of those areas particularly, and that way they don't have to worry about uh, cleaning up the whole building. And that's not to say that they're not cleaning up the whole building, it's just more of the fact that we want uh, students and staff and also faculty to make sure that they enter one way and also exit another way, or if the same entrance is the exit, then at least uh, the janitorial company knows to extra attention to that area. No, and, and I know the one time I visited my office, I did have a sticker saying that my office had been disinfected on this date. So they are they are doing the cleaning, but I, I see your point that they want to uh, focus on the high traffic areas uh, mm -hmm. or, or maybe like the restrooms, uh, places that more people um, are likely to, to use. Uh, well, I know that I I feel uh, more confident and comfortable after after speaking to you. So hopefully, our uh, faculty, staff, and students will also feel more more comfortable. Uh, I know Dr. Alvarez brought up the the HEPA filters uh, and other things that we could do in terms of the campuses getting more um, ventilation from outside, so that we could have uh, less concentration. Of or, or have that uh, UV lights. Uh, are, Mr. Padilla, I don't know if uh, you could talk about if we're implementing some of those or if maybe the newer buildings are, um, I know at Mission Del Paso, we are getting a new building uh, and maybe that one is more up to date on uh, ventilation or technology. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't know the specifics of those. I just know that uh, Mr. Lovato and his team uh, from physical plant, they they've analyzed the ventilation systems and and what's currently in place um, is adequate. Um, some of the newer systems and some of the recommendations, uh, which are a lot higher, that would incur a, a tremendous cost to the college as far as changing those out. Uh, but I know uh, Mr. Lovato and his team have gone through. Uh, they've looked at the systems and and they are adequate for for what we have right now, or with and what we have right now. And if I, as a faculty member, wanted to bring in my own little filter, um, I, I don't know, Dr. Alvarez, is do if I bought like my own little filter, is that for my class and dragged it around? Is that uh, useful or are they more, you know, are they just playing on my fears to to try to sell me a filter? I don't know if you can speak to that as as a scientist. Yeah, I, I've seen those uh, those units uh, advertised in the Again, you know, the more layers of protection you can put in, you know, the safer, you know, you're going to be. So um, just make sure, make sure that it's not just just a filter because most most are designed to filter out bacteria. 
which are a lot bigger than the virus. But I've seen a lot advertised that uh, that use ultraviolet light, you know, that you can put in, you know, even at your at home. Um, there's a little concern about UV light that can generate ozone, you know, so you always have to look at the pros and the cons. But there are some units that uh, will, you know, filter the air, like in a small office, you know, kind of effectively, and not, not only filter it, but treat it with ultraviolet light. So, you know, those those would be would be useful. Um, if, you know, if you wanted to just have a, an extra cushion of, of comfort, you know, that you're doing everything, you know, possible to eliminate um, the virus. Um, and the other thing is you mentioned antibacterial wipes and, you know, they, they fooled me on that one too. You know, I, I've been also trying to find, <laughs> uh, you know, the disinfecting wipes and, and there was, uh, and I found some, you know, on and off, you know, of different brands and um, of, of course the alcohol wipes would be the, the best against this virus. But be careful because those that come in a can, you know, uh, th there were some at one of the dollar stores one time that, you know, they have the, the little label that says kills the, the flu virus. Uh, so that means that they are antiviral, which is good. If they kill the flu virus, I'm pretty sure they're going to have an effect on the coronaviruses as well. Okay. But the last time that I went to one of the dollar stores, I saw the cans and, you know, I just ran to the shelves to grab some of those and I didn't even read. I just, you know, and I didn't, you know, I, I just took two, you know, I didn't just try to get them all. I, I took two of the cans and then I get home and I read antibacterial. So yeah, they're pretty effective against bacteria, but it doesn't really say if they're going to kill the, you know, viruses. So be careful with that. You know, the, the, the Lysol wipes that, that you can get sometimes and the Clorox wipes, those are antiviral. You know, those will be effective at killing the, uh, the virus. You know, they have different chlorinated compounds that, that do that. But if it just says antibacterial, they may not have a lot of effect killing viruses. <laughs> so, and, you know, and they got me on that one. It was like, oh, this is what I get for not reading instructions. Yeah. No, and and if they got you with the PhD in in biology, you know uh, what about the rest of us that you know we're we're more uh, lay people. Um, and and I understand it's also like a certain percentage of alcohol that it has to have, no, in order for it to be antiviral as well. Yes, yes, you know it's, it's usually over sixty, sixty five percent. That that would be good. Yeah. And and so speaking uh, speaking of that. Uh, I actually have a niece who just got a degree in engineering uh, and I, I kind of, you know, want her to start a business or for us to start a business doing N95 masks because that's another thing that I, I know that I started looking in January and Home Depot, Lowe's, everybody was sold out. Luckily, I still had a couple because, you know, I, I think I had I had some from the H1N1 scare because I'm that kind of person, right? Uh, but, but do um, I don't know if if any of you can speak to that. Uh, do we have like secret suppliers that you know for people in labs or or for medical professionals that maybe if the students are still doing their their rounds in the hospitals, uh, would they be able to to get those from us or or we are also um, you know, don't have that. Um, yeah, we're we're also not having those supplies. I don't know if our access to N95s, if we have that. So I guess I'll take that one. Uh, essentially, for that, what we're trying to do right now is we're trying to prepare for the uh, spring semester and getting the uh, supplies, because what the big problem is is the fact that essentially all the different uh, health programs that we do have on campus right now they require different types of um, masks and essentially just having one blanket mask isn't going to fit for all of the uh, like i said the healthcare programs so what we're trying to do at least uh what we're trying to find is um we're trying to find someone who can be like sort of like our go-to person to get the vendors that way we don't really have to be doing the purchase orders for those and essentially they would kind of uh, give the information to us and from there we can sort of uh, find them that way and that way, uh, you know, we can try to get, provide these items for students and not just our students, but also our faculty, faculty as well, just because the fact that they also need these uh, items as well. No, and I, and I could see where, 
uh, students in the in the nursing program or dental hygienists would want to have like the higher quality uh, mask to have the the higher quality protection. So okay, so those are those efforts are still. Uh, so it would be a good business for me to start with my with my niece if we could <laughs> produce N95 masks for the city. Well, some N95s you have to be fitted, um, mm -hmm. and and so. If you're gonna provide a certain type of N95, um, depending on the type, you would have to have them fitted for the individual. So based on the their the shape of their face, or you know, you know, so they're small, mediums, large, extra larges, because uh, with those N95s, you want to make sure that you have a proper seal around the face and around the nose, and and there's a whole uh, test that they go through in, in determining what size would fit you. So you you become experts in all all these areas. <laughs> no, I just, I just know that from the fire department when I used to work for the fire department. They used to yearly resizes for our N95s, and we would have to go through a test of, and then they would uh, blow saccharin through, and and there was this whole technical test that they would run us through yearly uh, to determine what size we would need uh, to wear. And then there's also like a training that's kind of uh, involved with that. And with that, for the healthcare uh, programs, what we do have is the EMS program, and they're the ones that kind of uh, do the training and also do the fit test for our different uh, students and even the faculty under those programs. And and so will there be uh, like maybe online modules for all the faculty and staff before we we go in, or some workshops on on COVID nineteen prevention? Uh, is that something that the task force is working on? Or maybe you're saying, still, you're still in the, in the planning process, was, right? I was making sure I didn't do it. So there's going to be an online training available uh, to faculty and staff uh, that will be mandatory, that they will have to complete uh, prior to coming back to work. Uh, so um, that will be available. Uh, we just had a meeting uh, prior to coming on here with you all uh, with IT and Dr. Pena, Malena Field, and uh, Dean Hajar and Ivan. Uh, where we were working out some of the final details on implementing that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was implemented for the essential staff that are going to be returning through the uh, phase returns plan, they were already trained by uh, certain faculty members on this uh, particular uh, COVID-19. And it just basically goes over the different things that uh, some of the things you did see in the PowerPoint that uh, Dr. Alvarez had shared. But also, it kind of uh, gives information about how to put on your face mask, things like that. No, that's that's wonderful, and I think um, you know there there could be some people that are still uh, skeptical that think it's a hoax, and so this way, you know, we'll be able to to get that information to uh, to them. And like you mentioned, we do have a mask mandate uh, policy, so even if uh, if students are or faculty and staff are hesitant to wear a mask, uh, that's the college policy, so they'll have to abide by that. Um, I know we're we're coming kind of close to, or uh, we're coming kind of close to the end of, of time. Uh, is there any other uh, area that you wish to address that maybe we haven't covered? I know I sent you a, a whole bunch of questions, uh, but maybe something that comes to mind that we haven't gone over or something that you feel would be important for faculty, staff, and students to keep in mind? Well, I'm sure I'll start. So I, I think there's there's been some word about the return to work plan. Uh, I know that's there's been some discussion on that and and why that hasn't been released to everybody. But um, the reason why it is we just don't know when we're going to be returning back to work uh, based on local conditions. As soon as things uh, start to improve, and we start meeting uh, those metrics that I, I went over earlier, uh, then then that plan that's uh, been developed uh, will will get final approval uh, from the board, and then that that plan will be disseminated to the employees so that they know uh, the different phases that will be returning uh, back to work. And and so it's just that we're still in the planning phase, so that's why it hasn't been. Uh, released and I I know the college does have a good website uh, that I believe um, Kristen Sanchez, one of the librarians for Rio Grande, did 
that tracks all the COVID cases uh, using like the John Hopkins uh, mm -hmm. data. So, so we do have uh, some of that information available. Uh, I just thought of, of something else and, and we are kind of running out of, of time, but um, I, I know that one of the board meetings, they mentioned that we might be in the process of developing an app. Is that, uh, is that something that's in the works or was that, you know, maybe I, I was, they were talking about the school district and not us. I, I'm not sure. Maybe that was in reference to the health screening agreement app. Was that was that it, Ivan? I'm not sure. That's it was, what I'm thinking. It was Dr. Graham that brought it up, mm, and and oh, she talked yeah. about uh, mm -hmm. maybe that the Clint district had an app. So I didn't know if if that meant that we were going to get an app as well to do maybe the contact tracing or. Uh, to do a little screening before we come in to campus. Well, there is there is plans to have a health screening agreement available online uh, to faculty and staff, uh, where they would have to uh, go on check in or log into the EPCC, my EPCC, and then they would fill out that health screening agreement. And I believe it's going to be six questions, yes or no questions, Ivan. Um, yeah, five, six questions. About five or six questions, and uh, uh, you know, if they answer no to all of them, uh, then they'll be allowed to come onto campus. If they answer yes for any of them, uh, then they'll be uh, contacted uh, by employee relations or myself or Ivan uh, on on why they they cannot access uh, campus at that time. So we'd have to fill that out like the night before, or the or 24 hours before. No, probably the day that you're getting ready, uh, because part of one of the questions is, uh, for example, do you have a fever of 100 degrees or higher? Uh, if you answer yes to that, then, you know, you should stay home. Uh, if you answer no, then, you know, then we know you don't have a fever. Uh, and, you know, the, the employer or, or faculty could uh, proceed uh, to campus. OK, well, um, I, you know, I feel talking to all of you, I, I thank you for your time. And I know that I feel more comfortable, uh, hopefully after people watch the, the show, uh, they'll also feel more comfortable that uh, we have a good task force that's on top of all these areas. And and so uh, thank you for, for taking the time to uh, meet with, with us and be on the Entre Nosotras TV show. Uh, and I, I wish us all a safe return. Uh, and, you know, I, I want to just um, thank you for, for doing the work that you're doing. In, in case you're not getting enough thank yous from, from faculty and staff, just, you know, maybe uh, concerned emails. I, I do want to thank you because I, you know, I know uh, myself as a staff member, I feel way more uh, confident and comfortable after having this conversation with you. So hopefully... Uh, you're going to do some workshops at faculty development because I think that's another area where you could reach people uh, or we'll try to put this uh, show on EPCC TV so that way that could be a resource for them as well. Uh, so so thank you for for your time and um, you know I think I think we're we're good to go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.